All right, so imagine you have heard or learned about this great technology that will boost your business. You also understand that to use that technology, you need to transform your organization. I'm Julian, with Ayan we're going to uh, share our experience in attacking or tackling this question, so how to do this transformation while keeping your shop open. Uh, you cannot just close operation, change and then start again. So maybe Ayan, tell us a bit more about Thermo Fisher. Yes, thank you Julian. You can go yeah, to the next slide. So maybe first a uh, slide to, uh, to impress everybody a little bit because I don't know to what extent everybody knows uh, Thermo, uh, Thermo Fisher. Um, I think many of you heard about uh, Vey as a company here in Eindhoven, but a few years ago uh, Vey has been acquired by, by Thermo Fisher. And Thermo Fisher is uh, uh, the world leader in surfing science, as you can, uh, as you can read, and a uh, worldwide company present uh, on all the continents uh, with more than 80,000 people uh, worldwide, uh, more than, what you can see, 30 billion of revenues. But what is actually very interesting also for this audience and of course for us here in Eindhoven is that Thermo Fusion is also committed to innovation and we're spending more than a billion on uh, R&D uh, every year. Um, then, um, yeah, we have an enormous amount of capabilities leading innovative technologies. Um, but we also do very good, I think, and that's important also in uh, the next uh, slides further on, is that we um, do that together with our customers. So we have close customer collaboration in all the R&D projects that we do, and that we also try to deliver our software more and more faster to the market to make sure that um, the customers can, uh, can make use of the great new, uh, new features. Um, but as a consequence, of course, we also need to have a software development uh, under control and making sure that uh, the software is as stable as, uh, as possible. Um, but before we go into that, um, I want to share you a couple of uh, innovation, um, no, was the first? Uh, a couple of examples on uh, what, we, uh, what we deliver as Thermo Fisher. Um, maybe starting at the left, we don't do that in Eindhoven, by the way. Uh, so the top ones we do in other parts of the world, but I still think it's relevant to share because Thermo Fisher as a company is also heavily involved in, uh, let's say, addressing the COVID uh, pandemic. So among others, we deliver uh, PCR tests uh, that are used by uh, laboratories uh, all over the world. But what is maybe less known is that we actually um, also are heavily involved in COVID-19 research. And then it brings me to the electron microscopes uh, at the bottom left, uh, because I think that many of you have seen uh, pictures of uh, the spike, uh, spikes on the, on the COVID uh, vaccine, of a vaccine on the COVID uh, uh, virus. Um, and those spikes have, made vi have been made visible um, by using our, uh, our microscopes. And, and sometimes you see an artist impression, but sometimes even you see directly the pictures that have been generated by the software uh, made by, uh, by Thermo Fisher. Um, so the Glacios is uh, one of our, let's say, key products currently in the market uh, that, uh, that helps there. Um, well, I'm not going to share all of the products there, mass spectrometry and the cell and gene therapy. But what is actually relevant for the story here is that um, a microscope like that, and to give you uh, maybe a better feeling, the Glacios there, it, it looks like a small machine, but it is, let's say, roughly two by two meters on uh, floor space and uh, three meters high. Um, but typically these machines, like many machines that um, other companies in the region sell, stay in the market for a very long time. So typically 10 to 15 years, but sometimes even longer, 20 years they stay in the market. And during the lifetime, um, they are continuously upgraded and um, um, they get uh, enhanced uh, functionalities. And one of the enhanced functionalities is in this case this imaging filter, which is helping to increase uh, the contrast of the, of the images. But that actually also um, uh, is a nice example of the problem that we're trying to face with help from, uh, from Julian and ICT, is that all these new modules also need to be integrated in the software. And that means uh, changes in the interfaces, changes in the API, uh, changes in the performance. Uh, these filters, they work on uh, rather high, uh, high speed nowadays, uh, the images that they uh, deliver. Um, so that, uh, let's say, uh, gives um, 
new challenges in the stability of the software. So throughout the lifetime of the software, we continuously see this new stream of innovations and uh, as a result, uh, changes in, uh, in the software. Um, yeah, next, I think. Yeah. Yeah. We're a uh, service integrator. Um, uh, we're about 1,500 employees now present in uh, mainly in the Netherlands, but we also have offices in Sweden, Germany, Bulgaria. And basically we do software and we try to uh, create solutions for customers. So we integrate many different uh, technology from partners and, uh, and yeah, the goal is to put that together to solve some of the challenges faced by our customers. And maybe Ayan can share one of his challenges with software development. Yeah. So um, as shown in the other example eh, with the selectors uh, filter, um, um, all these changes in the software continuously cliff uh, integration challenges. And I'm uh, decided actually to be very honest with you, so I don't let you pick all the details of the slide, but uh, <laughs> I think that many of you recognize what I've stated here. Eh? So whenever we integrate uh, software and new subsystems, we always have a challenge um, in uh, uh, making sure that the stability and the regression is not, uh, not, uh, not harmed. Um, and if you look at that, you can actually see in practice that many of the issues uh, are boiling down to not having under control our interfaces. Uh, and not only, and I think it was Dennis this, uh, this morning who had an interesting slide on that one. So, and then I don't talk about the syntax of the interface. I actually talk about the performance. Uh, I talk about the behavior. Um, all these aspects that are actually most of the time implicitly changed uh, during, uh, during software development. And they become visible at the moment that we try to integrate, uh, integrate the software. Now, and as a result, uh, we have integration problems during stabilization. Um, and um, yeah, that actually slows our uh, innovation down. And that's why we want to uh, address these problems uh, early on in, uh, in, the, in the development uh, phases. Yeah. Yeah, so then the question that we asked ourselves, how can we uh, do that? And uh, the conclusion was, and actually I have to say that TNO helped us greatly in that one as well. Uh, and, and we will probably show that in the later pictures as well. Uh, because we first needed to understand um, what is then critical to the interface and what would it mean for us if we could actually formally specify uh, the behavior of our interfaces, but also uh, automatically check the conformance of um, our uh, implementation towards that, uh, that interface. Um, because only if you have that under control, you can actually uh, make changes without what we call uh, fear. Uh, because then uh, at the moment that an engineer makes a change, you can actually show that there is no question. Um, and um, people can, uh, without um, um, yeah, being anxious that there is a, a, a problem later on, uh, make the nice features that we all need for, for example, the selectors uh, filter that I showed in the beginning of, uh, of one of the slides. And um, um, now the conclusion was after uh, a number of exercises um, uh, together with TNO, that indeed um, having control over the behavior is a key aspect uh, to, uh, to help here. And that modeling and, and also model-based testing will, uh, will help there. And that's when we come to the next slide. Yes. Yeah. So model-based testing is a way to model these interfaces. As uh, Ayan said, this is a good, good idea to do. And the idea is to capture in one model the behavior, as it was explained by Dennis also uh, earlier that day. Uh, so you can capture not only the syntax, but also what you expect in the uh, ordering and some time and data aspects. Uh, those tools are also an aid in uh, managing the complexity. This is the theme of this track. Um, by modeling, you make also visible what is the complexity of your interfaces. And the nice thing with model-based testing is once you have those interface models, you can generate tests from these uh, models automatically. So if you compare this to the normal uh, test approach, and uh, you write some test specification, then you derive test cases by hand, which means you have to predict the results, you have to execute them, check the result was correct, and all this is manual, where in model-based testing you replace all this by a tool that is smart enough to generate the test case for you. You have to focus on defining what, uh, what do you expect from the system, what is the visible behavior 
you want to observe and you let the tool uh, do the work for you. Right? And one of the things we observe here there is that you get much longer test runs that you ever do. So we have projects now where we're running thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of steps of testing in, in some hours sometimes, but very often in minutes. You can test that deep uh, where you will never do that uh, by hand, I guess. And the, the main message we'd like to share, or the, the main experience we'd like to share to do today with you is about the plan or the phases that we have identified and uh, some of them afterwards. Uh, we did not plan all this that way, but somehow we're doing it and we're learning from this and we want here to share what we have learned over there. So as Ian said, there were a kind of research phase. Uh, every phase you answer different questions and you try to move from the left where you're not doing anything with the technology to a phase at the end of the rollout where it has become your your routine way of doing testing in that case. And the first step is indeed was to answer the question, is modeling a good idea? Is something that brings value, something that we think, yeah, Thermo Fisher, can, can we do it? Uh, and I think that was very good work done there to prove that uh, also to higher, higher management. And uh, we joined here uh, late in that process, but somehow we managed uh, together with Steno and Thermo Fisher to get to that conclusion, yes, this is uh, important, and I think it was key to get also senior management engaged and committed to make the change possible. Then afterwards, you go to a kind of more technology-oriented questions. Uh, what tool and approach can I use? Uh, what is available on the market to actually solve that technical, to implement that technology uh, solution? And we did some research, and we came with uh, Axini. And there we started to do some pilots, uh, small projects to say, hey, is it something that could work? Could uh, Thermo Fisher work with it? Uh, we uh, involved our center of excellence within ICT to help. And at the end, yes, it was a good, uh, let's go further. And I think that's very important that you get uh, management committed because very often proof of concept stop at that point. It's good, can work, but yeah, let's move to the, uh, another proof of concept. But here at Thermo Fisher, they had that vision to say, no, this is a key technology. We know that we want to do that change and we all committed to do that change. So then we started a kind of consolidation phase where you confirm your choice. That, yeah, it's good, but let's explore a bit more. Let's involve more people. Later in this phase, we as ICT took over some of the work uh, of Thermo Fisher to do it ourselves, to show them how this is scaling. Uh, we invested in ga gaining the expertise to do this. So at the end, they really can get uh, a really clear understanding about the technology, but also how this will fit in their processes. And I think that's the question you answer there, is how are we going to implement, to adopt this technology in our organization? It's really not, the technological question was answered uh, not a long time ago, but it was answered there, and the question really was, how are we going to use this? Uh, yeah, what, what our processes, what do we need as an, as an organization to do so? And the next phase where we are moving towards right now is a rollout to say, okay, how fast and how good can we uh, adopt this technology for all the teams in our company? Uh, Thermo Fisher is a quite large software development uh, group, so this is quite a challenge as well to uh, to transform all these things in a given time. So if you look at the timeline, I think it's good to realize that change takes time. This is not something that you do overnight. Uh, in particular, the, the, the change that is ongoing now at Thermo Fisher is quite deep in the way they're doing testing. And it's, again, not something you do uh, very quick. So you want, in this research, evaluation, and consolidation phase, you really want to make sure that this is a a choice you can commit for, I don't know, 5, 10, maybe 15 years, uh, because yeah, once you have adopted the technology, you will not roll back in a very easy way. Uh, so yeah, it took time to do the research, to evaluate, consolidate, and rolling out is, is our current challenge to say how fast can we do it. Uh, and yeah, there are some limits, also from physics, how fast can we change things. Um, and that's, that's the next, next challenge. But here you see the curve with the expertise, and I think it's really important not to grow too fast, because it's, it's again a really deep change, and I think it was very important for 
Thermo Fisher to gain that slowly. Um, when you're really sure and you understand how you will implement it to then accelerate and um, uh, make the change, and then as fast as possible. Maybe if I add, uh, sure. this that, um, the, the, the challenge, of course, is that we have a very strict cadence in our development. So uh, we're currently working in a uh, quarterly uh, cadence. Every uh, quarter we do our uh, increment planning, as we call it. So all the teams are uh, then committed to what they deliver in that, uh, that quarter. Um, and uh, there is a lot of uh, business pressure uh, to work on new, uh, new features. Uh, of course, that's, I think with almost, almost all companies said that the focus is on delivering features. We also in the background have spent quite some time on also convincing our management and our stakeholders that um, of course we need to do feature delivery, but we also need to work on uh, technical innovation as we call it or architecture runway, as maybe people know it from an uh, HR perspective, but that we also need to spend uh, time still on, on, on support and technical debt. Um, but it also means that uh, the teams are actually busy focusing on uh, features and, and new technology, and um, having time for this kind of innovations is always an enormous challenge, uh, because it's a long-term investment, it's a long-term uh, stretch that you're trying to address, uh, while the business by nature is focusing on the short term. Um, so that's why, why you see this is, an, let's say, an, a gradual approach and that we need to take along the teams in, an, uh, yeah, in, in, the right, in the right pace. So let's look at what we have achieved so far. So we created several models, we supported several teams in adopting uh, this, this new technology, Axini. And uh, with the lightweight training was enough uh, for Thermo Fisher to work with us and to be able to understand what we're doing. And the nice thing is already by doing initial modeling, we already found issues that were not found by conventional uh, testing. So I think this was a quick proof of uh, the value of this. Uh, integration in CI/CD pipelines, this is also something that you have to do uh, and to answer that question before you start uh, running out uh, in your uh, enterprise. And as I said, we completed the evaluation and uh, consolidation phase and we're moving uh, towards rollouts. I think what I'd like to spend some time is sharing some lessons we learned so far. So uh, um, uh, I am feel free to add anything and, and jump in. So model-based testing really changed the way uh, you do testing. You're really focusing on creating the models, focusing on the requirements, what do you want to observe on your system and then you let uh, the, the tool generate the rest for you. So it's a very positive uh, result. You spend less time in testing at the end. Uh, and you get what we observe in, in, in the work we do is you get the right discussions early on. So you really get the discussion about, but is this core order really what we want? Or we observe some delays in some processing of the uh, function. Is that something that you can explain, something that you can expect? And so you get content, really content-based discussions very early in the project, in, in the development cycle. And I think that's very valuable. As soon as, uh, the sooner you can understand and catch all these issues, the better uh, we all know that. Uh, the other thing is forced to specify all interfaces. So you often focus on the top level of the provided interface for your systems. And uh, to do proper model-based testing, you also need to have a clear, defined way an abstract definition of the uh, hardware that is uh, below. And this is not always the case. And I think that uh, you get here good motivation and uh, reasons for uh, addressing that problem. I think most of developers and architects were aware of this, but they had no ground, no, uh, no, yeah, no reason to, to use and to, to do something. And now they have one, so that's also nice. Um, Again, it's, it takes several iterations to create complex models, but already with the early ones, we could find uh, some issues, so that's nice. Um, and uh, the way we're doing now is really that we, at ICT, we do it. We show uh, Thermo Fisher what it is to do it and how this will work. And our next phase would be to transfer that knowledge uh, once they have uh, existing models that teams will be able to take over these models and uh, work on them themselves. And that seems to be a, an efficient way to, to do this transformation. So short reflection about change. Uh, so Korta is uh, also one of the theory behind change. So what have we, uh, that's a theory, that's the middle. 
and uh, three bullets uh, or three points outside that uh, we do. I think this, uh, the first one, a one, two, and three sense of urgency, guiding coalitions, develop vision. I think this is what Thermo Fisher did together with TNO AZ to say, hey, let's develop a vision about what do we want to do with these interfaces? Is this something that we see as strategic? Uh, this was key uh, in making the change uh, possible and su successful. Uh, I think remove barriers, uh, the, the way that we do it, uh, we are really seen by a Thermo Fisher as extra capacity. So then it's easier to get in and to be accepted. Uh, so you free them from some testing efforts. So you remove here a, barri a, a barrier uh, to make the change possible. And currently we are looking at uh, how to build on uh, what we have done so far and uh, make this part of the culture and how they, they work and do the testing every day. Maybe then just to yeah, sure. To that one is indeed that um, the teams itself, they can still focus on their day-to-day uh, -day work and they have to do a relatively small investment in uh, supporting this. And then uh, by that, they have less issues in exactly uh, addressing the current feature uh, pressure that they, uh, they have. They can still do that. Uh, and that's what we mean with the support scene as additional capacity at no cost. So of course uh, we do this together with ICT and there are some commercial agreements, but from the team perspective, from the engineer's perspective, they see it that they can get help, and that's actually the essence of this remark, I think. They get help in uh, trying to make these models, um, but it, it's not a burden for them, uh, or at least a very limited burden, let me put it like that, uh, to start modeling, uh, because the bulk of the modeling work is done uh, by the model-based testing support team. So to conclude and finish on time, uh, so the, the change is feasible and again it requires commitment from, uh, from senior management and to free some time for the teams, uh, but it's, it can be limited at the beginning. And to us, uh, you need to have the domain, uh, knowledge of the domain, you need to know the technology, you need to know the organization and the processes. Um, we found by combining our forces with Axini, us and Thermo Fisher that we could get all these skills together and make the change uh, possible. And by this, thank you for listening and we're happy to take questions. Thank you, uh, Ayn and uh, Julian. You're welcome. Do we have questions in the, in the room? All the way back, so I have to <laughs> do a long walk this time. <laughs> Thank you uh, for your again, a very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, my name is Erik Moederhals from Philips. I uh, have the following question. Uh, there's a well-known model that's the uh, test triangle, where you have uh, a lot of tests at the, the low level of your system mm -hmm. and a few tests at the higher level of your system. I was wondering, this kind of uh, automatic test case generation, is that suitable for all levels of the triangle, or only for one level? Um. Yeah, that's it. The, <coughs> the change process is, uh, I think, applicable for any technology change or technology introduction that you want to do. If you talk specifically about uh, this model-based testing approach, um, we actually recently uh, concluded that we have two kinds of automation possibilities. Either we do what we call API testing, so we have a software component with a clear API, a software API, and for components that have a clear software API, actually you can use this uh, this approach very easily um, although we have restricted ourselves currently for uh, the critical uh, subsystem interfaces first so maybe over time we will do all the subcomponents as well but currently we are focusing on the more let's say bigger subsystem interfaces um, we also still do testing at what i would call complete product level which is most of the time done through the uis that's also automatable, but then you have a completely different type of tools uh, that you can use to automate, for instance, UI testing. Uh, and that's uh, a different approach that we're also exploring and looking at. Um, but this approach is primarily for really APIs uh, around uh, bigger components or bigger subsystems. Okay, thank you. Maybe a follow-up question. Um, 
Do you plan to then uh, replace all the manual tests or the manual created test scripts by this automated test case generation, or is there always a hybrid situation? Um, my ambition is just that it will naturally, naturally displace all the manual testing. Um, whether that's completely realistic, I don't know. But um, let's say for the first teams that now did this, they already see that it overlaps and actually improves um, their manual tests. So they will not use their manual tests anymore because actually this is doing the same, but with higher coverage. But I think it's a learning curve. So I'm not imposing upfront that they should throw away on, uh, let's say, replace existing tests. Um, my hope, let's say, uh, guesstimate is, is that over time we will see that there is less and less need for manual testing. So uh, currently I'm only challenging the teams not to write manual tests immediately. First look at this and only if they can prove uh, then uh, that there is still a manual need, then do a manual test. But that's part of the learning curve. I don't think I want to impose immediately, stop what you're doing. It's more showing that this works, show that we have better coverage, show that we find better issues of, of more issues. Um, and then I think by coaching, mentoring, the teams will over time understand uh, that a classical way of working is not needed anymore. Okay, thank you for the answer. Yep. Well, I have an excellent overview from you. Um, <laughs> anyone else who wants to raise their hand for a question? If you want to left. as well. Um, I'm going to use this again, this is our explanation. So your change model, mm -hmm. the communicating vision part, I'm wondering whether you focused on the early adopters or the experienced people in the team. How, how did you communicate the vision? Just PowerPoint slides or different stuff? No, I don't think we had lots of PowerPoints, some of them, but the communication is really talking directly to the architects of and the developers and spreading the good words uh, directly to the teams. I think that was, uh, I think, very eff effective to have a link on the one hand uh, with Arjan and, and, and senior management of Thermo Fisher, so all the main architects and the, the, uh, the managers over there, but also for us to then be the link with the teams and the, the, the other product owners and, and architects and developers to show them what it is and, and communicate their vision through us, uh, I think that's, that worked quite nice. Yeah. Uh, but actually, maybe that's even less visible for Julian, to be honest. There are actually two levels of communication going on. So I think that uh, in the phases, uh, what works pretty good uh, in the last uh, period is that there is a weekly or a bi-weekly, uh, let's say, uh, stand up with the modeling team and the teams that are now uh, that are involved in the pilots. And that's the bottom up part. Um, especially in the research phase, where we work together with TNO, um, we actually had uh, our senior management and our directors involved, showing that the approach uh, is, is of value. And I'm still monitoring in the background the business case, and every now and then uh, my boss is uh, chasing me, hey, uh, how are the figures doing? I don't share them with ICT, but uh, of course I get that question and I need to do some calculations on how much effort did we currently spend, how much did we pay uh, our, uh, <laughs> our consultants, um, and does it really pay off? So that discussion is of course going on in the background, uh, but I try to hide and shield that from the teams as much as possible. Uh, but of course, uh, yeah, uh, we're an, uh, an, a big company with all the financial controls in place, uh, so I can uh, actually assure you uh, that, uh, that I get a question uh, on a regular basis. Uh, but that's, that's, let's say, the management level of communication uh, that's more about finance, but technically, and Julian is fully right, we try to do it bottom up and get the architects and the leads involved and basically show them, give them demos. Uh, so I was very happy uh, on one hand, on the other hand a little bit sad, that we were founding the first issues in one of the first subsystems. Um, of course said that we find issues, but on the other hand, uh, immediately my discussion is that team is now over because they actually see uh, that it works. And that actually helps me come to the other team, say, hey guys, your colleagues in that team, uh, they, uh, they notice that it works. So that's how the ball gets, uh, gets rolling now. Yeah. 
but it's a slow process and sometimes you have to be patient if you want to ask me I would go faster but yeah of course there are uh, the yeah, limits uh, yeah, yeah. It, it goes in steps but uh, it's a long answer maybe for a short question but <laughs> it's, uh, Currently, it's primarily ICT who's making the initial models, um, and um, the the plan is, and we actually also training the first groups, but we do that in steps. So we had how many people? Eight, nine Something people, like I think. This, yeah, between eight and ten. Eight and, eight and ten engineers, test engineers, and architects mixed uh, trained, so they can actually understand and discuss with the ICT people what is in the model, how the model looks like, etc. Uh, now the steps comes to actually also ask them to make changes to the model, but that's a stepwise approach. There's a, let's say a more detailed plan behind it, uh, or a kind of master plan I would, uh, would call it. Um, um, that we first let this team do it, and then when there is a sufficiently mature model, then slowly we can ask them, okay, if you want this change, hey, maybe try to do it yourself, so that over time the teams can actually grow into the modeling expertise. But yeah, what I said, the main focus of the teams is doing the development and of course interfaces is part of the charter. In practice they don't always have the time to really uh, isolate themselves for one or two sprints and only focus on this. So we need to do it in a stepwise and, and uh, yeah, a gradual manner. Uh, but we, we make sure that everybody who is involved gets uh, at least an initial training before we start with them. 